Hello and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is a unique collection from Japanime Games for their Halloween collection. We're taking a look at three games, Demon Worker, The Terrifying Girl Disorder, and this one over here, Kimomini Panic, a deduction-based game. All three games are based on the line of trader deduction, worker placement, and an interesting, unique card drafting style game. Well, this is our Halloween special, so I hope you enjoy it as we show you three games and three reviews for each of the games. So here we have all three games from the Halloween collection, and we're going to go through them in order from this one first to this one, and then finally this one. And they're cut in portions like this and like this. Okay, so over here is the Terrifying Girl Disorder. And in the game, you're going to be getting the box and the rules here. You'll be getting four of these shard cards, which you're going to be using to draft cards, and you're going to be getting your player aid cards that tell you how, what is going to be in uh, or likely to be in the deck there, and how many points you're going to need for each each of these and how many cards as well. Uh, this is your big stack of cards here, which is going to influence the game. It'll be uh, all the different personas you can choose to be as you go throughout the game, because you're not going to know what you are until the very end, which proves to be very interesting. And this is the turn order in which you're going to get to go flip it this way or this way, depending on how you want to do it. And that will determine what cards you're going to be getting. And I'll show you more in detail in a bit. This over here is Demon Worker, and it's a worker placement game involving you starting off with basic useless human beings to help you and progressing your way through uh, influencing devils and mermaids and basilisks to go ahead and help you on your quest to gather different resources. These are all the resources in the game and these cards here are going to be the locations in which you're going to be gathering different resources and paying specific resources. You're also going to be getting a turn order count which will give you certain uh, food and victory points, additional pieces for when you need more than one of a specific type and you're running out, so five of these guys here. You're also going to be getting a player card for each of the different um, demons. You have uh, Asmodeus, you've got Beelzebub, Satan, and Angra Mania, and of course all the different worker uh, tokens you'll be using throughout the game. And finally, you're going to be getting some contract cards, which are getting you points at the end of the game, provided you have the requirements. And over here is the evil point board. It goes from 0 to 50, and then when you go to 50, you collect one of these things here, and you can start over again. Uh, another thing here is just the round marker which explains that after the fifth round of the game the game is over over here is Kimo Mimi Panic, a game of deduction in which you're going to be getting a big stack of cards. It basically plays similar to games like Resistance and Werewolf, in which you're going to be basically pointing at players to destroy their decoy cards and then eventually destroying them. You're going to be getting a character card as well as a secret roll in which you're either going to be trying to steal decoys from your opponents or you're going to be trying to locate and find the thief of the crescent and full moon, depending on how many players are in the game. It'll come with a targeting card, which you'll be utilizing to spin around the board and target specific players for either lynching and or hanging are uh, of course to steal from them. These are all the different roles, these are all the different character cards, so there's quite a bit here. It's a deduction game though, but those are the three different games from the Halloween collection for uh, Arclight games. It tells you all the different names on here, mainly Japanime games. All right, let's come up and I'll talk about each one of them in a little bit of detail as well as a little bit of a story for you, and then we'll go back down individually and I'll show you how each are played. Okay, so let's go ahead and discuss all three of the games one at a time, though, starting with the Terrifying Girl Disorder. In this game, you are playing as one of the females who has blossomed, and blossomed in the game is basically when they, uh, basically like mutants in X-Men in which they've gained their powers randomly. They're all going to be part of this school, and unfortunately when one of the girls blossomed, it made them all forget their memories and forget their identities. In this game, you're basically going to try and remember your identity, and of course, you're going to have these cards to help you along. These cards here are going to basically tell you the different character names, how many of each of the different types of character cards they ha uh, you should have of them, and how many points you're going to get at the end of the game, as well as any benefits that they provide. Of course, by the time the game is over, that is when you're going to know your identity, and of course there's a potential that you won't even know your identity at that point, but whoever has the most points in the game is going to be the winner. And you'll be utilizing a circular board in which you're going to be turning the board around and adding different cards around and whatnot. So it's going to have this interesting deduction slash strategy in which you're going to try and manipulate your tableau. A demon worker is basically you're playing as a power broker in the underworld as one of the four demonic characters. You'll be trying to recruit players in the underworld to do your bidding and acquire certain resources and have the most influence at the end of the game. 
the Kimomi, Kimomimi Panic is a game in which you're basically a bunch of uh, cat-eared gals who've decided to create your own unique new town and you're going to be attempting uh, to keep your treasures in the town because unfortunately a thief has a Rosen, the evil crescent moon thief and if you're playing with a larger player game the full moon thief as well they're gonna be trying to steal your treasures and you're going to try to protect them because you need to keep them in order for your town to be prosperous all the players are going to have treasure and if they all lose their treasure and the thief is still around then the thief will win there's a secret informant though and if the informant is left for the thief the informant will win and if the thieves are managed to be captured during the day phase then of course the citizens will win those are the three different games we'll be talking about we'll start of course in the order I described them as for how to play the game in a very simplistic uh, overview and then we'll come up and I'll tell you what I think about each one of the games so now let's go ahead and go down below for our Halloween featured walkthroughs so here we have the Terrifying Girl Disorder, and the game is for two to four players. Every single player is going to get their player mat, which has its own unique color, but they all represent the same thing. They show you all the different eight characters that you can uh, potentially play. There's one secret one here, which is basically a condition if you don't actually manage to uh, get a character within the game, which is possible, but not very likely. You're also going to get a shard of your color, and the shard is pretty simple. It's a card you'll be placing down this grid here, as well as you'll be getting four cards in your hand, if you're playing a three-player game. Um, over here is going to be a circle of cards from this deck. It's all shuffled and they're all the same cards. And you have three cards for each player that is currently playing the game. And which means you're going to just put them in a circle just like this. Make sure you have the deck somewhere within reach as well as this little turning symbol which will be used for the first player. The game's going to go in turn order by starting with the player who you choose to go first. So maybe we'll choose this player to go first. In which case all he's going to do is uh, place this shard down. He can place that on any of his cards any of these cards he wants is going to be trying to select the ones that he wants to gain. So he's probably maybe place it like that. Maybe he wants fours for some reason. After that, he can choose to uh, swap places with cards. Maybe he wants a lot of fours. So to ensure that, he's going to do something like this. That will give him more force uh, potentially throughout the game. After he's placed his shard and he's placed his uh, swap, the next player is going to get to go by simply going, okay, maybe I want uh, twos here, so I'll place uh, this here and I'll swap these guys here. And then, of course, the next player is going to get to do that as well. And maybe they'll just swap something like this. And uh, the final player will do the same. This player maybe chooses this one right here, and maybe he wants a variety of cards. So, oof, let's, how about, let's go with this. So he'll take this, because already he's gonna get a one. And the swap has been made. Now, after that happens, then uh, the starting player is going to get to do something interesting. They can play cards from their hand. They can choose to play more than one card, but it has to be of the same suit. So for instance, they could choose to play two sixes. Now the reason they might want to play two sixes is because maybe they want to be six at the end of the game or uh, simply don't want somebody else to gain the sixes. You're going to look at your chart here and it tells you in order from one to six uh, what all the different cards do, but it'll also tell you on your uh, card itself here. Now if you look at your little player board here, it's going to say for if you have this character and you have one card and you are that character at the end of the game, you'll get eight points. And let's say you get more than five or five, you'll get 14 points. It'll also have a bonus victory point condition, and a power. The power is going to be whatever the card uh, happens to be when it's played. So Ira here says name a rank, and each player must discard one card of that rank from their recollection area which would be in uh, where th this is the recollection area. So nobody has one. So that would probably not be the best power to use right now, but it is an option. So the player can go ahead and play that. After they've played that and they've used their special ability, which they did and couldn't really use it, and the next player is going to get to go. Oh, and they also have two sixes, but maybe they will choose to use this two instead. And the two over here is Gulan. It says take two randomly selected cards from another player's hand and add them to your hand and then give that player two cards from your hand. So we'll take two cards from this player here, and then we'll go ahead and give this player these two cards. And the reason why is because once you've played cards of a certain rank, they cannot be played again, unless you have no other cards in your hand to play, in which case you would reveal your hand and play a card of the same rank. So we're gonna go ahead and give them these sixes here. 
here, which may prove to be uh, beneficial to them, potentially, uh, but likely not. Okay, so the next player is going to get to go, and they're going to go ahead and play these fours here. And the fours here say, take a card from the recollection area and add it to any player's hand. Well, there's no, no card in your recollection area right now, so these would simply sit there. And uh, these cards are going to go down. And finally, this player is going to get to go. There's two threes in their hand, so they'll play those threes. Or maybe they won't want to. I mean, it's, it's going to depend on if maybe you can get that extra three there. And if you look on this card here, it'll tell you uh, what the three is going to do for you. It's Tsutsuki. Let's see, where are you? Here you are. So you want... Yeah, you want two cards, actually. Two cards will give you 12 points of the game. So each of them are going to depend on how many cards you want. So I'll play that there. And it says you can play an additional card of another rank from your hand into your recollection area, even if it is of a rank that you already played. So well, we'll go ahead and drop this one here. And you don't get to use the ability. Put it down somewhere in the same area, because there's going to be five rounds of this game. After everybody's played their cards, then uh, the first player is going to select which way they want the game to pro progress in. Is it going to be clockwise or counterclockwise? And this player wants the uh, the fours and the three. So you're going to head, she's going to go ahead and flip it like this. And in which case, uh, bring her shard back and gain the card that was on top of it on all of the cards up until the next player's shard card. And uh, it was going to go in clockwise order for each player as well. This player will get their... Uh, Let's see, this player is this one right here, and they're going to get these two cards, so they'll go into her, her hand. And then uh, the red one over here, I believe that's you, is going to select all of these cards into their hand, and finally the last player over here is going to get that, and these cards will go into their hand. You can never have more than eight cards in your hand. If you have more, you discard down. Uh, after that is up, the player who played the most cards uh, during in the recollection area is going to get to start, or uh, if there is a tie, it'll be the person with the highest rank. So it would be this player again, in which case you're going to go ahead and flip over three cards for each player again and put them in a circle, just like before, and you're going to play yet another round. You'll do this uh, for five rounds, and after the fifth round is up, you're going to tally points. And the way points works is you're going to be going ahead and... Uh, Determining which one you have the most of in your recollection area. So if you have uh, three sixes and two ones, uh, the sixes are going to win out. In which case, you're going to go ahead and look for each you go, uh, and it will be right... There you go. And then you say, okay, I have two of them, so that'll give me ten points. And if you have any sixes in your hand, or any of the cards in your recollection area that you are, you'll get bonus points there, so you get two more points, so that would give you twelve. And plus the bonus victory conditions. So it's plus one bonus point... Um, for each Ichigo card that is in another player's recollection area. So if there's any sixes in anybody else's recollection area, which there's likely to be, you're going to gain victory points as well. And each player will do the same thing. Of course, there's going to be five rounds, so there's going to be five different sets of cards you're going to be playing down. And whoever, of course, has the most is going to be the winner. Uh, just because you have the most cards down of a specific type, you might be that character, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the most points uh, out of that character. Each of the characters are different and are going to involve different cards you want to play down. So just be aware of that. And that's the basic idea of the Terrifying Girl Disorder, an interesting game that I haven't played anything really like this game, but now we'll move on to Demon Worker. So here we have Demon Worker, and uh, a lot of what's included, there's one extra character that I don't have in here, it's up to a four-player game, but I'm just going to show you a three-player game. In which case, there's three different character cards out, everybody has their blue tokens that are attached to their two humans that they start with, everybody's going to get six uh, Demon Worker cards to start in their hand, as well as, after you do this drafting, you're going to get these contract cards that you can gain throughout the game. Depending on how many players in the game are going to be, depending on what cards are going to be in play, these are these nine, but there are are more in a four-player game. And then you've got a big stack of all of these resources that you're going to be gaining throughout the game. Um, it went, depending on turn order is going to determine uh, what players are going to get as far as the food is concerned. This is three, this is three at a victory point, and this is four. So I went ahead and gave Red their victory point to start the game off, and he's got three and he's got four. And these can change throughout the game. Everybody now has their cards here. And the first thing that's going to happen after you go ahead and place your first round, you put your 50 points over here and you got your characters out. Uh, victory points is you're going to do a draft before anything else and you're drafting workers these workers or workers are going to be able to summon and it'll have a, have a cost to summon them and it'll have a cost to sending them out to uh 
do some workery things. And so you're going to choose one and then you will pass and everybody's going to do that until they get six demon workers. And instead of doing the draft, I think you get the idea. I'm just gonna leave these six here with each of them, but just know that there's a draft prior. After that, players will get to draw two of these things here. They will choose one and put the other on the bottom of the deck. So everybody's going to have one of each of these things here. And they're just gonna have different requirements uh, based on the different resources in the game and how many points you'll get at the end of the game if you complete these. If you don't, you just don't get the points. I set aside these extra times fives, which can be used if you run out of tokens. And the round one is set to go. The first player is simply going to take their worker here. They're going to pay the cost to run that worker and it'll tell you what it's gonna cost. This will be a food. So you take that and you go ahead and place it on any of these locations over here. Now, each of the locations is going to cost you something, This uh, or likely to cost you something. This one here says if you subtract four of these yellows, you're gonna get two victory points and two of these uh, weapons. This one over here lets you draw contact cards, discarding a contract card, and exchanging different resources. This one gives you three yellows. Um, this one here gives you one uh, of the reds, which is really good. This gives you minus three battle. If you can pay three battle, you get four points and a red. Minus two red will give you seven points and three yellow. Two of the blues over here and four of the food. And to make life even easier, you can go ahead and arrange it like this, which is what I would probably do. So you can see the ones that are basically free that are going to give you stuff, which are all four of these guys here. The ones that are going to cost here, and then the unique ones, whether it be uh, this one here, which will allow you to gain workers, or this one over here which allows you to gain contracts. Now, uh, that's that's the basic idea. So you'd place a worker down somewhere and then you would gain the resources. This guy would gain a plus two of these here. And you have to pay, of course, your food. The next player would get to go with his worker and he'd take this off uh, and then he'd gain four food and so on and so forth. So you get it how it's a worker placement. What's unique and interesting about this game is you can gain points as you're playing it by simply getting specific cards, whether it be uh, this one here by spending two red, you can go up the track seven points, or um, there is, I believe another one over here, which is gonna give you four points. Now, when you summon workers with this audience room, uh, they're all gonna have a different cost. And the cost is gonna be here and the running worker symbol at the bottom is going to be uh, the cost to, to bring them out. So it's not necessarily going to benefit you to have more workers out if you simply cannot pay for them. Another interesting thing is you're going to gain abilities when you place this character specifically, when you get this character, you put one of these on him and that's another worker for you to utilize. Uh, but whenever you place him on this specific area here, you're gonna gain plus four victory points. So that can gain you victory points throughout the game. This one here, if you place this character here, you're gonna gain plus three more food, but it's gonna cost you a yellow to bring him out. And uh, this one over here is, it will uh, double the space. It's pretty cool there. And so on and so forth. So all these workers have their own unique abilities that when you bring them onto different locations, they're going to give you uh, unique abilities, including the location's ability itself. And they're all tailored for specific locations as well. The humans are kind of a basic worker, which you just go ahead and place on the board. Another thing to note is you can place on the same location as another player, but it's gonna cost you additional food. And after everybody has either used all their workers or passed, the round will end. And in which case, you're going to then start up a new round, uh, switching these around, um, passing these on. Players are going to get the different resources once again and continue the game as a normal worker placement. After the fifth round, the player should be pretty far along in the point tracker somewhere. And then you're going to tally up the points. Now, another way to gain points at the end of the game is if you have the resources required to run the worker at the end of the game, so for whether it be like this guy here, if you have two of these foods, you're going to get six victory points at the end of the game, as well as the contract cards. For instance, having this one and having three of these fights and one of these reds is going to give you 12 points at the end of the game as well. And so you're going to have the ability to get bonus victory conditions. Uh, and that's the basic idea of a uh, demon worker. Of course, I would explain that these guys here are, if you run out of tokens, you'll have additional ones. You simply put one of these on here and it represents a times five, a pretty cool, unique little aspect of the game. And as you gain points, maybe you gain past 50, you can take this and put it on your card there, which will illustrate that you already have 50 points. Uh, and that's the basic idea of this game. So let's go ahead next and talk about uh, Keiko Mimi Panic.
So here's the game, Keiko Mimi Panic and everything included. It's a game of deduction like it states. You're getting a rule book and of course the box, as well as all these cards you see here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and set up the game right now to show you how it works. But basically what's gonna happen is all these character cards, you can go ahead and shuffle them, uh, but always include Detective Shamrock. She's always gonna be included in the game. And to note as well, when you're playing the game to start off, it tells you the four, five, six, seven, and eight player uh, starting points. And at the very end of uh, the booklet here, it's gonna tell you all, all the characters abilities as well as character options for each of the different player sets as well I just went ahead and set it up randomly here in, in, in which case there's gonna be four players and five different roles set up uh, randomly including one informant which will be shuffled in just like this so you don't know whether or not the informant is going to be in the uh, game uh, there's always going to be at least one Thief of the Crescent Moon, so we'll go ahead and get rid of one of these guys here. Uh, but in an eight-player game, you'll include the Thief of the Full Moon. So there's our four roles here. There's our four different characters, and we'll just go ahead and set them up just like this. Every character has their hidden role now, and every character is going to get a decoy. Decoys are going to be utilized to protect you from being eliminated. Uh, the starting player is going to get the, uh, the Crescent Moon card just like that. And the rest of the decoys aren't going to be needed. The target card will go in the middle here. Um, and Detective Shamrock, there's an extra card here just to show you. There's some variants in the cards, which is pretty cool. I think there's a promo, actually. So now you went ahead and set up the game. All these characters are not going to be needed, and neither are all of these roll cards. You can go ahead and utilize them for different variants on the game as well additional changes that are going to be made. So to begin the game, it's pretty simple. You're going to have a, a voting phase, basically, in which players are going to do the yes or no as to whether they think that somebody's a thief. Uh, players are also going to point uh, at a player and target and try and remove them from the game. There's a night phase as well, in which every single player is going to put their fingers out just like this and um, our players put their fingers out like this, I suppose. And the thief, which is, these are all secrets. So there's an informant right there. There's a citizen. Uh, there's the thief, which happens to also be Shamrock. And there's the citizen uh, is going to be turning this target card around. Uh, another thing to note is too, when you're playing with Shamrock, which should be every game, uh, the beginning of the game, uh, the, uh, the day phase, you can point at a player and basically allow them to determine whether or not they are a good guy or a bad guy. If they do this, that means they're good. If they do this, that means they are the bad guy. Um, and at the end of the day phase, when you're the leader, you can do the above again. So you have the ability to basically be a seer in this game. Um, it doesn't help necessarily when you are actually the thief of the Crescent Moon as well, though. So that's that can be uh, detrimental to uh, the good guy's plans, right? Uh, but the thief isn't going to point at somebody, and once they've pointed at this person, everybody's going to wake up, they're going to move their hands away, and whoever's pointed at is going to lose their decoy. If they ever are pointed at, either during the day or night phase, and they don't have a decoy, they get removed from the game, and if that person is the thief, the game is over. If it's a civilian, the game continues. And there's three ways the game is going to end. Either A, there's only two people left, in which case, if it's a thief and it's the informant, the informant will win. If it's a thief and a civilian, the civilians will lose and the, the thief will win. Or if um, the the uh, Crescent Moon thief has been eliminated during the daytime phase, the game will end and everybody on the humans or the, the good guys team, the uh, citizens teams are going to win. Another thing to note too in this game is that each player is going to have different abilities and numbers next to their abilities. And the number is going to be based on uh, the powers 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 5. So 1 starts and so on and so forth. And that's how you determine ties. Uh, this one here says full moon during the day. You can change the day to the crescent moon. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, because every round, this card is going to move to a different player. And that player will be the starting player. And uh, depending on whether or not it's on crescent or full moon is what thief is able to steal during that night phase. When you're playing with less than 8 players, Players. There's only one thief in play, so the full moon phase means that nobody's going to get stolen from, and the crescent moon phase means that, the, that, that somebody's going to get stolen from. And it'll just continue like that until there's only two players left, or the thief gets removed from the game. And so everybody also has their unique abilities. Another thing to note, too, is some of the characters um, are going to have specials, like this lonely citizen here, which says uh, whenever it's, she's eliminated, uh, the player to your right loses their decoy card, which can be very painful, I suppose. So it can convince people not to attack you 
you. And then of course your main abilities. It's a basic little trader slash deduction game trying to search for the good guys as well as the bad guys depending on who you are. And the informant has an interesting unique little role as well. And that is basically the game Kekko Mimi Panic. Um, of course there is a ton of extra stuff involved. Those are just the roles. These are all the different player cards as well. So let's come up and talk about each of the three games and what I think about them in our Halloween review. Okay, so let's go ahead and review all three of the games from the Japan Anime Games Halloween Collection. The first one is The Terrifying Girl Disorder. Now, this game is unique. It's interesting. It's something I haven't seen before. As far as the mechanics go with tableau management, I have seen before. But as far as choosing cards on a circular uh, track, as well as uh, one player is going to be choosing the rotation of how that works, and you're going to have so much power in certain turns and more power in another. And then depending on the cards you play and how many you play of them will determine your role at the end of the game, which will determine how many points you have. You can manipulate whether or not your opponents are going to have points at the end of the game more than you by knowing what their roles they're intending to be are. Of course, gaining cards into your hand that are your role are going to give you points, as well as specific bonus condi conditions are going to give you points as well. You need to watch what you are doing as well as what everyone else is doing. So there is a lot of craziness that's happening in this game, but it's all quiet. Everybody's sitting there going, okay, what does he want to be? What does she want to be? Oh, is she going to do that to me? Will I get to keep this class? Oh, maybe I want to put four of these cards down, even though I only want three. That way somebody will remove one and think something differently. Also cards can be played face down which is unique as well depending on certain cards which would make players wonder exactly what you are. Now when cards are face down you can't obviously reveal, um, you, you can't obviously play the same card face up but you have the ability to hide that specific number up to a certain point in the game until players can deduce what that, that number is. But overall, it's fun. It's unique. It's interesting. It's going to be a niche game, I think, for specific people because it's not one of those basic style games which everybody understands or knows about. I think this one's going to slide under a lot of people's radar, and I don't think that it should because it's a really fun little game. It's something I'm going to play more often than not, uh, especially when I want to play something that's unique and play, uh, maybe gamers that play a lot of different types of games they want to see unique mechanics. To terrify Girl Disorder is going to be one of those games we'll try out and see what they think about the game. Personally, a solid, solid game. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, as well as the artwork, too. I like all the artwork for the game. All these games have a, the unique uh, anime slash manga style artwork. Some of them are going to have a, a gals with a little bit larger bosoms, and some of them are, are going to be like the demon worker, not so, not so, uh, I guess, um, lucrative, not lucrative, but like sexual, I suppose. But they're all they're all PG-13, really. They just have some bosoms going on. And uh, it, it's my wife approved, so she, she enjoys the, the, the games and their artwork. So whatever you want to think about it, it's up to you, I suppose. Uh, demon Worker. This one here is a basic worker placement. You're going to get demons, you're going to get humans, you're going to be placing them on the board. But what's unique about this game specifically is the demons that you hire are going to have abilities that are going to be based on the board and their different roles. They're going to be placed Played. Uh, some demons are going to be more helpful in certain areas than others. And how you draft them really makes a difference in the game. The first time I played this game, I lost very, very poorly, very, very badly because of the drafting aspect of the game. I wasn't quite aware of it. So I think some players are probably not going to like the first game of it because they're not going to realize how powerful certain demons are and how they're going to help their specific strategies. Because everybody has their own unique strategy in this game and you can gain points during the game, after the game, with contract cards provided you uh, send your demons out one more time at the end of the game. So there's a lot of way to gain points in this game as well as manipulating how you want the board to go. And of course you can still play on places that have been uh, placed by other players but it's going to cost you more food and uh, you want to reserve as much resources as possible in this game. It's really fun. Everybody who played this game after the first one, like we got used to it, started enjoying this game over and over again. The drafting really makes it unique and interesting every single time. And the fact that there's additional, additional locations, so a different amount of players in the game, which changes up just a little bit enough as well. Um, if you got something probably like Caverna or Agricola or something big like that, this is probably not going to wet your whistle enough because it's smaller than that. It's a pretty simplistic uh, uh, game in nature it's only like 45 minutes to an hour so if you're a deep uh, player that's into like the deep strategy uh, worker placement games maybe not so much this is more of like a medium to light variant of that with of course the drafting aspect but overall a fun little game a nice little gem as well uh, the final one here is the game of deduction Kiko Mimi Panic this one here is in the cross between oh werewolf meets resistance with a couple other little traitor aspects. Now, what's cool about the game is, unlike werewolf, where you get eliminated instantly, which is still one of my favorite games, werewolf, um, 
what's, what's unique about it is you get a decoy card, which will protect you for a round, regardless of whether you're getting stolen from or being uh, attacked by the town folks or the other citizens. So you get to stay in the game a little longer, which I like. I like that. I like being able to play a game a little longer than the first night getting getting kind of kicked off. But they're quick enough games to where it's it's okay regardless. Uh, this one here is better because it's one of those card games that's going to last a little longer. I think on the box here it says about 45 minutes. I think that's about right. And uh, you have a bunch of roles. What's really cool about this game is the amount of different roles included. This has probably more roles or the, more roles than the Ultimate Werewolf game, as well as the fact that the different roles are completely varied. Uh, they're not like Ultimate Werewolf. There's a few similarities as far as like there's a hunter class that kills somebody. Uh, there's the seer class but uh, other than that there's a lot of uniqueness to the game and the stealing is interesting as well putting your hands out like a Ouija board kind of and having somebody drop down and turn it is kind of is really interesting and unique and like you're nervous like we, we, you feel the rush of wind move down your hand as somebody is doing it and you know it's not you as a thief and you're like oh I feel the wind from over here or oh, I don't know so it has that really cool little trader aspect to it uh, it has cute little gals with the uh, cat the cat ears and whatnot. If you like trader based games, deduction based games, another another little gem, another another little game I really enjoy playing. I mean, I love deduction games in general, so that will be up to you whether or not uh, it's going to be your cup of tea. But for me, it was fun. It plays up to eight players, and it plays. It's when you can't play Werewolf or uh, another game that requires more players as a deduction deductive game. This one you can play four players, and it plays solidly because it lasts longer. The person's not instantly out, and it plays well with eight players as well with an added interesting uh, additional thief. And the last little interesting thing about the game is the informant. The informant only wins if the informant is left alone with the uh, crescent moon at the end of the game, and only the informant wins. So they're not actually working with a bad guy, but they are at the same time, which is a nice added bonus uh, which reminds me kind of like a uh, duction murder in Hong Kong there's a character that does something like that as well overall all three games are fun they're all unique in their own way and they all have their little certain benefits uh, I think the things that would throw people off maybe are their simplicity or the uh, artwork for certain ones uh, as well as the fact that they're not maybe I guess like, as I said they're not as like thick and like strategic base they, they do all have forms of strategy and if you're going to pick in forms of strategy which one this one has the most this one followed closely behind and then this one probably the last it's a little deduction based game right all the artwork to me is pretty fun and cute and of course these two have very similar artwork whereas the demon worker has very different artwork it'll be up to you though to decide which one you think is good for you if any at all uh, personally I do recommend all three of these games as little hidden gems diamonds in the rough as Aladdin were to say or Jafar I suppose Anyway, check down below in the link in the description if you want to check out any of these three Halloween games from Jap Anime Games. Uh, that is all I got for this review. Thank you for watching and happy Halloween here from Unfiltered Gamer. Oh, my voice is dead. Goodbye.